Ministers and members of government present, our esteemed host, the Lord Mayor of Kigali, honorable mayors, governors, and all local leaders present, distinguished delegates and friends. We warmly welcome you to the closing plenary of Locks for Africa 2020. This session will start now at 1 p.m. Central African time and will finish at 3 p.m. Central African time. And we hope that you will stay with us during this opening plenary and engage via the chat box that is open. We would love to hear from participants where you're joining us from and share some thoughts in terms of what you've learned during the Locks for Africa Congress. This, after, this morning or afternoon session, depending on where you are in the world, will be a combination of live and pre-recorded interventions. And we have translation that you can find on the bottom tab of the Zoom window. So we have English, French, and Portuguese translation available today. As said, the chat function is active, and we will also be sharing resources from our side with you that we hope will be useful as we hear from our various panelists during this particular session. So for now, we want to start with the first segment of this closing plenary, and we will hear from our hosts. And it is apt and fitting that we begin with our co-host, the city of Kigali, who is represented here today by the Honorable Mayor Prudent Ruben Giza, who will share a short intervention, and then we will see a video about the city of Kigali and some of the wonderful interventions that are being implemented. Honorable ministers, fellow mayors, heads of UN agencies, private sector leaders, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. I am honored to join you today as the mayor of the city of Kigali during the closing plenary of the fifth edition of Local Climate Solutions for Africa, the virtual congress that has been co-hosted by the city of Kigali with the theme, Financing for Change. On behalf of the government of Rwanda and the city of Kigali, I would like first to thank ICLE Africa, Covenant of Mayors in Sub-Saharan African countries and cities for the law they have played in convening Locks for Africa Virtual Congress in Kigali to ensure that momentum in tackling climate change continues to be built. Secondly, I wish to thank all participants for taking their time and joining us to this remarkable virtual congress organized for the first time across the continent and co-hosted by the city of Kigali due to the current pandemic that we are going through. The eighth day Local Climate Solutions for Africa Virtual Congress has been invaluable and the city of Kigali in particular learned a lot from the exchange with other African cities and also actions being taken to tackle climate change through nationally determined contributions. The Locks for Africa Congress has been a reflection time for African cities to co develop climate finance roadmap, to implement climate action in African cities as a response to lack of sufficient finance to implement climate actions in most African cities. Locks for Africa Congress has been a way to overcome COVID-19 pandemic obstacles where it has been one forum for African cities to benchmark on how to redesign climate emergency and prevention of biodiversity loss. This Congress has also been a forum to share best practices in dealing with climate change shocks that will enable to make our cities resilient to climate hazards that we are also facing. On behalf of the city of Kigali and the government of Rwanda, I thank you all for your contributions towards accessing climate change finance. And also, I take this opportunity to welcome you to the city of Kigali next year for the Lox Africa Congress in 2021 that will physically take place in the city of Kigali. You are the most welcome. In Kenya, Rwanda, we say, Murakazaneza. Thank you very much.
Kigali. The capital city of Rwanda is well known of being the cleanest city in Africa and that is true. To reach on that point costed the high investment of engaged citizens themselves on the role of greening the city and the impact it brings on the human being and protection of environment. Through the government of Rwanda, the city of Kigali has a long projection of planning and availing the environmental friendly estates as well as affordable houses and impervious to the climate changes. It is in that regards the Kigali City Master Plan 2050 also specifies greening and beautification infrastructures and as of now some have started being executed among them planting beautification flowers in the trees at the street shorelines. It has also planned conservation zones to avoid human activities to destroy them. Within this agenda of fighting climate change effects, the city of Kigali plans to embark on public transport rather than private owned transport methods in a bid to curb gas emissions. The city encourages everyone to use the public transport instead of personal transport because it is faster, cheap, and it helps in reducing gas emissions that are harmful to the air we breathe every day. In 2016, the city of Kigali started Kigali Kafri Day, coupled with a bimonthly mass port. It is open event initiated with the main aim. On one hand, to promote the culture of sport among Kigali city residents, and on the other hand, to make Kigali a green city. Making Kigali a green city, while mobilizing city residents for an active lifestyle to prevent non-communicable diseases. Among the climate change mitigation plan, there is a continuing program of relocating people living in slow plants and high-risk zones to the model villages that Kigali City has planned so that these citizens can have access to the basic needs easily. Many families were relocated from wetlands to protected areas that were occupied by houses and results with floods but for now no family and other activities left there. In the city of Kigali garden and trees are planted at the streets and the ravine to control flooding water from the mountain are built and within 2050 master plan the climate change mitigation and environment protection will continue to take center stage of city's plans. In Rwanda as well as in city of Kigali Rwanda Environment Management Authority has started to burn of using plastic bags and promote the usage of other packages that are not harmful to the environment. The government has also increased taxes to imported used car so that to reduce the increase of old cars which affected the air we breathe. In the city of Kigali, car-free zones were established to help pedestrians to move freely without traffic jam of cars. Kigali green and clean. Thank you, Honorable Mayor. We now have the honor to hear from another of our co-hosts with the government of Rwanda and the city of Kigali. We are joined today by the Secretary General, Mr. Ladislas Ingenda Himana, who is the Secretary General of the Rwandan Association of Local Government Authorities, and he's joining us live today. We hand over the floor to you now, Mr. Secretary General. Please unmute yourself and put your video on. Thank you very much, distinguished participants for protocols observed particularly the Lord Mayor of the city of Chigari and the leaders of ICLE. Larga has been a co-host to this local Climate Solutions for Africa. And it is my pleasure to represent the Rwanda Association of Local Government Association to be part of this closing session. I think it is a good to recognize all the participants, not only the organizers, because all the participants played a role to make this virtual Congress to become a success. So it is also part of good lessons learned from the pandemic as well. We, on behalf of Larga, uh, I would wish to 
to thank ECLE Africa for a successful Congress, to which we are proudly recognized as co-hosts around the city of Chigari and the government of Rwanda as well. Particularly, I wish to thank the government of Rwanda for promoting the military level and the, the local government and the municipality collaboration between the local government and the central government. It is my pleasure at this time to recognize this officially and to recognize ICLE for also recognizing the relevance of Rariga to be part of this virtual Congress. ICLE Africa's uh, fifth local climate solutions for Africa was virtual, it was a virtual Congress and it has pushed the boundaries of what we thought could be possible in Africa. Indeed, this is the first virtual event of this kind and uh, on the continent, I think it is the first one and uh, we needed to recognize this and uh, to recognize the urban leaders who took part to the discussions uh, and uh, who contributed to the topic of climate finance. On behalf of Rariga, in the opening, uh, I delivered the opening remarks on behalf of the association. And uh, again, I'm happy to be part of the closing session. And I thank you for having allowed us to speak at this respected panel. As I mentioned during the opening ceremony of the local climate solutions for Africa, we all have a part to play in this process. The formal recognition of the important role that vertical and horizontal integration plays in the implementation of the Paris Agreement could not be more necessary. We hope, and uh, I wish this can be a reality, not only hope, but uh, can be translated into a reality. Uh, I hope that this would be formally be taken into consideration by the United Nations of Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change and uh, the COP26 presidency as we move towards the next COP2021, which shall take place in Glasgow. Uh, honestly, I would wish this one to be taken forward. Building on the success of the local climate solutions for Africa virtual Congress and the strong collaboration being with the government of Rwanda with our members, the local governments in Rwanda, but particularly with ICLE. It is my pleasure at this uh, uh, occasion to announce that Rariga shall join other local government associations and uh, the local government and the municipal authorities. Rariga shall be part uh, not only as the African national network, but also as a responsible institution, which was a co-host to this uh, co virtual Congress. So I wish to announce that Rariga shall be uh, part of the roadmap to the COP26. Uh, that is uh, our commitment as the association. We wish to build upon Rwanda leadership as the first African nation to submit a second revised nationally determined contributions and I wish also to inform the participants that Rariga was part of this process as we were interacting with the government of Rwanda. So we look forward to continuing to strengthen our partnership with ICLE, particularly and the local government and the municipal authorities on the road to COP26. And as we all prepare for the African COP27 presidency in 2022. So it is my pleasure that to announce and to inform you about this commitment and we shall ensure that Rariga takes its role and plays its part in this process and we shall ensure the sustainability and uh, the commitments from this Congress shall be a reality within the Rwandan local government authorities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Honorable Secretary General. We really appreciate your input here today. So we now move to the portion of the program where it is my honor and privilege to share some of the closing reflections from Locks for Africa 2020. And I do so on behalf of ICLE Africa and the Covenants of Mayors in Sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, our co-hosts who we have just heard from. Locks for Africa 2020 attracted over 1,300 registrants who joined us from 91 countries and 370 cities. 
500 of our registrants were government officials, 152 were from academic and research organizations, and we were happy to see 121 representatives from the private sector, particularly due to this year's focus on finance. We have been together over eight days and 35 sessions. We had over 200 speakers and attendees who spent a whopping 3,487 hours in our virtual platform. It must be said that it was a leap of faith that we all took to convert an in-person Congress to one fully online and virtual this year. We did so due to the global COVID-19 pandemic that has plagued 2020, and because we felt that we could not allow the pandemic to slow or halt the important conversations that must occur during 2020 on climate action and on finance for change. As Dr. Catherine Torre from the IDRC so aptly said in one of our LOC sessions, building collaborations and relationships are foundational for effective climate action. And LOCs for Africa 2020 provided us with an opportunity in a physically distanced world to continue to deepen existing relationships and establish new ones. We do hope delegates were able to harness the Congress platform's social lounge and networking opportunities. The climate emergency and the biodiversity crisis are playing out while the world tackles the current global health pandemic. We know that 2016 to 2020 is set to be the warmest five-year period on record, and that one million plant and animal species face extinction, perhaps within decades, more than ever before in human history. As one of our esteemed speakers in the opening plenary, Ms. Christiana Figueres often says, we are outraged, but we are also optimistic. During Locks for Africa 2020, we heard reasons for this optimism. Mr. Stefanis Ignore from the European Commission spoke of the EU external investment plan already operational and expected to generate up to 44 billion euros of additional investment in Africa for low carbon and resilient infrastructure. Mr. Ben Mokaseng from the Development Bank of Southern Africa reported that municipalities comprise about one third of their loan books, which is equivalent to approximately 2 billion US dollars. And Mr. Drazen Kukin from the Green Climate Fund stated that the GCF has to date implemented 124 projects to the value of 5.6 billion US dollars. Yes, more needs to be done, but significant progress is being made. There is no doubt that the climate emergency, the biodiversity crisis, and global health pandemics affect us all. No one is spared. But what these crises have also brought to the fore, perhaps more than ever before, is the stark reality that it is the poor that bear the brunt of these challenges. Tackling inequality is our most intractable challenge, as Professor Edgar Peterson of the African Center for Cities said during LOCS. And during this Congress, we have had deep discussions. We've unpacked how we move, how we eat, who has access to energy and what type of energy, who has access to nature and the services it provides, and what does this mean to them? And what data and information is listened to and analyzed? And perhaps most importantly, how we can finance solutions that are responsive to these discussions. There was a golden thread in most of the conversations, which were perhaps very different to what we have heard in the past. Participants focused their discussions on process, not only outputs and called for a widening of perspectives and ideas for tackling African cities' most pressing challenges. Locks for Africa 2020 sessions ranged from deep conversations about the intrinsic value of nature, to talking about how we need finance to flow to hyper-local projects, as well as large-scale resilient infrastructure investments, and what bankability means in both these cases. We heard poetry from youth living in Malawi, we drew cartoons together, were inspired by brilliant photography, our capacity was built, and in every panel we benefited from reflections from diverse perspectives, private sector, civil society, researchers, and government officials. As the Honorable Mayor of Umshla Tuzi, South Africa, so aptly put it, government must be accessible and open. We need to reduce bureaucracy and make sure that we attend to businesses. 
This could mean the difference between the survival and death of an idea. To assist cities on their finance journeys, two vital resources were launched during the Covenant of Maize and Sub-Saharan Africa Day. Firstly, finance roadmaps for climate projects that detail proactive steps that cities can take to secure funding for climate projects. And secondly, a sustainable energy access and climate action plan toolbox that provides easy to use step-by-step -step guidelines to assist cities in their climate change planning. Over the next days, we will be finalizing the Climate Finance Roadmap for African Cities with our partners. This roadmap builds off all the discussions held during Locks for Africa 2020 and will chart ways forward for African cities to access climate finance where it is needed most. This roadmap will be taken forward during 2020 and 2021 in the lead up to COP26. Locks for Africa 2020 would not have been possible without our partners. In particular, we would like to thank the European Union, the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, and Swedbio. I would like to close these reflections from Locks for Africa 2020 with a quote from Mrs. Heike Hen from BMZ, who said, the decisions we make now will cement our urban development pathways until 2100. The stakes have never been higher, but we have also never had a community of practice as strong and dedicated to the cause, the cause of charting a more sustainable, climate resilient, nature-based, food secure and equitable future for African cities. With that, we now uh, hand over to our mayors, our political leaders for their interventions. And first off, we hear from Dr. Manuel Dorajo, who is the mayor of Kelamani Municipality in Mozambique and also a member of the ICLE Africa Committee. Over to the mayor for his pre-recorded intervention. Distinguished panelists, honorable mayors and leaders, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Manuel de Araujo and I am the mayor of Kelimane City in Mozambique and I serve as the Africa representative at ICLE Global Executive Committee since 2018. I have been part of the ICLE network and walked the Lox Africa journey with my fellow mayors for many years. The debut Congress, Locus Afri for Africa 2011, was convened in Cape Town, South Africa, and co-hosted by ICLE Africa and the city of Cape Town. The event attracted participants from around the globe, drawing an audience from over 25 West, East, Central, and Southern African countries. Following the first Locks for Africa Congress, the flagship Congress series has provided an important platform for dialogue and action, has continued to grow in momentum, bringing us together today at the ICLEI's Africa's fifth Local Climate Solutions for Africa Congress, hosted together with the city of Kigali and the Republic of Rwanda. The ICRE Africa Locks for Africa Virtual Congress is the first of its kind on the continent using virtual platforms to bring together leaders and innovators to exchange new ideas and strategies for climate action across the continent. And this year, more specifically, to find solutions for unlocking climate finance in Africa. We know that less than 3% of global climate finance flows to Sub-Saharan Africa. And it's almost impossible to find out how much of these 3% flows to the local level where climate finance is needed most. Cities are where the rubber hits the road in terms of dealing with climate change. To this end, the key output of the conference will be a financing for change 
roadmap and action plan where each section such as the UNA section has contributed to identifying necessary actions for each thematic track based on the inputs and discussions facilitated. I call on my fellow mayors, partners, friends and colleagues here today to work together to inspire change, move toward tangible results and catalyze climate finance action on the continent. Thank you so much, Honorable Mayor. We now are joined by another Honorable Mayor who joins us live, the Honorable Mayor Rohi Maliklo, who is the Lord Mayor of Banjul City Council, the Gambia, and also the President of the African Capital City Sustainability Forum. The ACCSF, founded in 2015 by the city of Shwani, South Africa, and with the Secretariat hosted by ICLI Africa, is dedicated to bringing all of Africa's capital cities together to mobilize and accelerate policy changes, multi-level governance, collaboration, and local actions to address the cumulative and deeply in interconnected development issues their fast-growing urban communities are facing. Mayor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope I am coming clearly. Loud and clear, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon to all of you from the Gambia. Hello? Honorable Mayor, we can hear you clearly. Please proceed. Okay, gratitude to your excellencies, ministers, his worship, the Lord Mayor of Kigali, honorable mayors, distinguished guests, and all other protocols respectfully observed. I would like to share a goodwill message from the ACCSF to the Locks for Africa 2020 and the assembly delegates. But first to the partners, hosts and organizers, I want to share thank and appreciation on behalf of the cities that I represent who are present today. Please allow me first and foremost to honor, in particular, my colleagues at the ACCSF Presidium who are, who are unable to join us today due to their very busy schedules. They are Vice President, Honorable Mayor Solham el Wadin of the city of Dakar, Senegal. Second Vice President, Honorable Mayor Mohamed Sadiqi of the city of Rabat, Morocco. A very big thank you goes to our host country, the government of Rwanda, moreover to His Excellency, the mayor of Kigali, Bundes Rubiska and his team. Sincere thanks goes to all partners and to Italy Africa for the excellent event. Ladies and gentlemen, Honorable colleagues, the role of capital cities is crucial in responding to challenges such as the ones we are facing now. This is because capitals are unique and important instigators, both at national level, but also in a pan-African context, such as the level of the African Union. Over the past few days, mayors and members from the ACCSF have participated in various events like LOCs who serve to solidify our community of local and city leaders. 
we were reminded the importance of city leaders, city, uh, of city leadership, that is to say, coming together. I therefore want to emphasize the importance of national governments, regardless of size, to come together in addressing global challenges. And this is where mayors, governors, and our communities' voices are very, very important. This is where we should come together, especially during the current COVID-19 pandemic, to the increasingly urgent climate crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, this is because, as we know, implementation of the community. Challenges like the current health crisis, when we come together, we will surely overcome these problems in our cities. We believe that African capitals have an important role that we must now act upon in building an African vision for sustainable cities of the future in line with Agenda 2063. Ladies and gentlemen, honorable mayors here present, as the newly elected president of the ACCSF, I am looking forward to building the ACCSF, working with Italy Africa, which hosts the ACCF Secretariat. I also intend that the ACCSF works closely with ICLE towards the next looks in light of the importance of the sustainability agenda and of the rules of our capitals. So on behalf of the ACCSF, I also share my endorsement of the climate finance roadmap for African cities. And I call for us to continue this collaboration and mobilization for access to finance to address climate change and indeed all of the sustainable development goals. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, honorable ministers here present, honorable mayors, delegates, and all protocol again respectively observe, I wish to retaliate my thanks and congratulations to all partners in this event and of course to our host, Italy, and to the government of Rwanda and the city of Kigali, again in respect of the Honorable Mayor of Kigali, our host, and finally, to put emphasis again of asking my fellow mayors to come together and be committed to the cause of sustainability in our cities. I thank you so much. Thank you so much, Honorable Mayor. And we must thank you so much for the significant leadership that you show in your own city, your own region, and also on the continent. And we're greatly honored to have had you live with us today. We now move on to Honorable uh, Mayor Mohamed Sefiani. He has uh, pre-recorded a message for delegates uh, today. He is the mayor of the city of Chefchaouen in the Kingdom of Morocco and a member of the Ikli Africa Regional Committee. He also holds many other titles and sits on many other boards, such as the Covenant of Mayors and Sub-Saharan Africa Board, and is also the president of the Intermediary Cities Working Group at UCLG. And without further ado, we hand over to Mayor Sefiani. Honorable Minister, Mayor, Delegate International, Honorable assistance. 
Tout d'abord, je tiens à remercier et à féliciter ECLI et l'ensemble des co-organisateurs et partenaires d'ECLI Africa pour le succès de la cinquième édition du Local Climate Solution for Africa. Les différentes sessions, ateliers et rencontres ont été très riches. L'année 2020 est une année exceptionnelle, caractérisée par la pandémie et ses impacts humains et socio-économiques. Maintenant, nous commençons à voir le bout de tunnel avec la dernière annonce du vaccin. L'urgence pour l'année 2020 était bien de trouver des solutions pour éradiquer la pandémie. Le climat doit revenir comme sujet prioritaire et comme la véritable urgence de 2021 et des années à venir, car nous, allons, nous avons perdu beaucoup de temps et nous devons le rattraper. Nous, les maires et les leaders locaux et régionaux en Afrique et dans le monde, nous devons être dans les premières lignes de cette grande bataille. Les villes ont un rôle très important pour l'implémentation des agendas mondiaux et notamment l'agenda climat et les objectifs de développement durable. 75% de la population mondiale va vivre dans les villes en 2050, qu'elles soient métropoles, intermédiaires ou petites. 80% de la consommation d'énergie se fait actuellement au niveau des villes et 70% des gaz à effet de serre sont produits dans les villes. Le nombre d'habitants qui vivent dans les villes intermédiaires sera d'environ 50% de l'ensemble de la population mondiale urbaine. Le développement des villes intermédiaires en Afrique se fait avec une grande vitesse, ce qui veut dire qu'ils ont un potentiel énorme. Il y a deux ans, au Maroc, dans ma ville de Chéron, lors du premier forum mondial des villes intermédiaires, il y a eu la déclaration charte des villes intermédiaires, document de référence pour l'implémentation des agendas mondiaux dans les villes intermédiaires. Un mémorandum multilatéral pour le développement des stratégies nationales des villes intermédiaires au Maroc a été signé. Ce mémorandum multilatéral est donc une initiative pilote qui pourra être dupliquée dans d'autres pays en Afrique et dans les autres continents en prenant en considération évidemment le contexte spécifique. Aujourd'hui, avec la crise sanitaire actuelle et la crise économique sociale que connaissent les différentes villes du monde, on peut confirmer que la coopération multiniveau est primordiale. En effet, la pandémie COVID-19 nous a montré que les valeurs telles que la solidarité, la proximité, l'égalité, la durabilité, la résilience sont indispensables pour la définition de nouveaux modèles de développement des villes et territoires. Les villes intermédiaires comme les villes métropoles ont joué un rôle important dans la, lors de la période de confinement et ont garanti la continuité des services publics nécessaires, que ce soit administratifs ou techniques, est-ce avec la coordination et l'appui des gouvernements nationaux Le dialogue, la coopération et la coordination multiniveau, que ce soit entre les villes intermédiaires et les métropoles d'une part, et entre les villes intermédiaires et les autres niveaux de gouvernance d'autre part, sont indispensables pour une coopération urgente et verte des villes. Nous avons noté que les villes intermédiaires ont été en général les moins affectées par la pandémie du point de vue sanitaire, mais elles ont été les plus impactées économiquement et socialement. La pandémie a montré aussi que les villes intermédiaires peuvent jouer un rôle crucial pour l'implémentation des agendas mondiaux lors de cette décennie. Il faudra les accompagner et les appuyer. Les plans de relance post-2019 doivent être verts, résilients et localisés. Les villes intermédiaires en Afrique doivent saisir cette opportunité historique pour bénéficier d'appuis techniques et financiers en vue de réaliser ces plans stratégiques et notamment les infrastructures de renforcement des services publics. L'accès au monde de la finance internationale devra être facilité pour les villes intermédiaires. L'accompagnement et l'assistance technique devient une urgence pour que les villes intermédiaires connaissent, qui connaissent en général, une insuffisance des ressources humaines spécialisées et bien préparées. Le rôle d'intermédiation, la taille et la proximité, l'effet de masse critique sont des atouts pour faire face aux défis climatiques. La Convention globale des maires pour le climat et l'énergie est un très bon instrument pour structurer les politiques locales pour la lutte contre les effets climatiques. Mais environ 9 000 sur 10 000 des villes qui ont joint la Convention des maires se trouvent dans l'Europe et l'Amérique du Nord. Nous devons donc faire plus d'efforts en Afrique dans ce sens-là. L'Afrique participe avec seulement 4 des émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Et elle est une des principales victimes des changements climatiques. Nos plans d'action en Afrique concernent essentiellement les programmes d'adaptation, en plus, bien sûr, des programmes d'atténuation. La COP26 à Glasgow sera organisée dans un an. Nous, les villes, nous devons nous préparer. Il y aura la révision des indices, mais nous, les villes en Afrique, 
et dans le grand sud du monde, nous devons avoir un appui vraiment particulier et urgent pour pouvoir jouer notre plein rôle. Et là, les réseaux et alliances des villes, comme ICLE et les autres, ont une mission importante à accomplir durant les prochaines années, en poursuivant et renforçant le lobbyisme, l'appui, le partage des bonnes pratiques, le renforcement des capacités la et la facilitation de l'accès à la finance climat. C'est pour cela que je peux dire que Local Climate Solution for Africa était, comme j'ai dit tout à l'heure, un grand succès. Et un des messages clés de cette édition-là, c'est l'élaboration d'une feuille de route pour les finances climat pour les villes en Afrique. Et ça, bien sûr, ce document stratégique sera une base de travail pour la fin de cette année 2020 et pour l'année 2021 en préparation de la COP26. La pandémie nous a appris comment vivre avec l'espoir et trouver des solutions innovantes et urgentes. C'est pour cela que je suis vraiment très confiant avec l'intelligence collective de travailler ensemble comme des, quand, contre les changements climatiques et préserver la terre pour nos enfants et les prochaines générations. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Honorable Mayor. We now turn to uh, another intermediate city in Mozambique, and we turn to the Honorable Mayor Paul Novinte, who is the mayor of Nakala City in Mozambique, for his pre-recorded message. I would like to, you know, call for all mayors um, in, from Africa, all mayors in Africa. We that leave it because I do know that uh, all mayors face the same problem. Uh, all cities in Africa, they face a lot of difficulty on, on how to get financed. So uh, we, I recommend all mayors to cooperate, you know, within uh, the course, uh, on the course organization, ACLE, so we can get support from them. And also, I would, lo I would like to call all mayors uh, to be one, uh, one, and to ask all non-government organizations around the world willing to help the cities. That way, if they want to help the city, all of us might agree one thing. Those organizations can help the city directly and stop sending the money to the national government. From the national government to the city, we might not get those money. So calling all mayors to, to be together and uh, We, uh, we may work together and to make our cities in Africa sustainable cities, um, trying to bring the Africa, you know, because Volpe, when the Kilimani, when Durban is, is developed, you know, those cities also that help be developed, like the city of Durban, the city of Johannesburg, the other cities, Kikali, uh, other cities, they might help other cities how to develop also. You know, we might cooperate try to bring our continent sufficient because right now many people live in this city and our cities must receive those people and also might not stop there. The city might develop, the city might develop and we need to help each other. The city of Kikali, the city of Zimbabwe, Harare, or whatever the city is, need to cooperate with other cities in order to make Africa greater. Africa must be one. One continent, developed continent, with its resilience, a lot of this come together. And that can happen when the mayors understand their calling, which is to develop and to help the people to live a better life. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that inspirational message, Honorable Mayor. We're now particularly excited that we have uh, Councillor Susan Aitken, who's the leader of Glasgow City Council with us live. She will share some of the work that's ongoing in her city, but we're also very excited to have you, Councillor, because of Glasgow being the host city for COP26. So we hand over to you. Thank you very much, Megan. Um, Lord Mayor and distinguished delegates, good morning. Uh, bonjour from Scotland. And thank you to Glasgow's friends at Eakley and to the city of Kigali and the government of Rwanda for hosting local climate solutions for Africa and for giving me the great honour of speaking to you today. In recent weeks, our status as the host city for next year's United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26, 
has thrust Glasgow to the forefront of global conversations about the role of cities in the climate emergency. And it's been inspiring to me to find common cause with our international family of peer cities on our shared challenges and to reinforce our commitment to a safer and fairer future for all of our citizens. I've been particularly looking forward to today's event, my first hosted from the continent of Africa, because among many reasons, it provides Glasgow with a great platform to build on the story that we've been sharing with the world in recent weeks. That city story is, I believe, a powerful and compelling one, charting the course from Glasgow's carbon intensive industries of the past to the low carbon and sustainable developments of the present. It's a story that will resonate across the world. And for that principal reason, it's also appropriate that Glasgow should have the privilege of hosting COP26. But with that privilege also comes responsibility. We as a city have a responsibility to the visiting states to delegates, activists, and our citizens that we host a successful event. We have a responsibility to other cities that their voices can be heard amid the international focus on nation states, and to our people that the ambitions and aspirations of COP are relevant to and improve their lives. But we also have a responsibility to be honest, to be honest with ourselves as a city about our role in the causes and consequences of global climate injustice. In recent years, Glasgow has begun finally to properly acknowledge our historic complicity in the transatlantic slave trade and the imprint of our role in the British Empire. There's increasing recognition of the legacy of colonialism and the lines that it left on maps, and that it's no coincidence that these are increasingly the sites of climate related disruption and conflict. Glasgow City Council, which I lead, and the University of Glasgow and many of our partners are driving forward discussions locally on how to atone for that past. Our responsibility as COP host extends to us as a city being open with the world about that past and how we propose to address it. I'm proud to lead an outward looking and internationalist city, one with a strong reputation for standing in solidarity with those demanding social justice and equality across the world. And we're fortunate to be home for the, to the Centre for Climate Justice at Glasgow Caledonian University, a unique uh, resource of global reach and importance the centre works to support what the former Irish president, Mary Robinson, calls a just transition to a safer world. As we increase our voice in advocating for climate justice on the world stage, Glasgow has commitment and world leading expertise to call on and influence to bring to bear on national governments, particularly those such as the UK in the global north where both the greatest responsibility for the causes of climate change and the greatest fiscal power to address them lie. That fiscal power must be distributed equitably across our planet and must prioritise those peoples and communities who are suffering the greatest loss and damage from climate change right now, but have so often made the smallest contribution to the causes of climate change. In coming weeks, we'll enter a formal partnership with the hosts of COP25, Santiago in Chile. It's a symbolic passing of the COP baton, a platform on which to nurture our common interests on the sustainability agenda and climate emergency, but also on economic and social priorities. Stretching across continents and hemispheres, partnership, partnerships such as this can be instrumental in, in ensuring that the voices of cities are heard in the climate debate. COP hosts have that privilege and responsibility to push harder together to engage the world in the climate emergency. Whoever emerges as hosts of COP27, and of course, there's a strong case to be made 
for that being an African city. Glasgow stands ready to offer the hand of friendship and extend our alliance in tackling climate change and its consequences. I want to conclude by borrowing the words of one of Scotland's best known human rights campaigners, Professor Sir Geoff Palmer, who has done a huge amount to teach Scotland about our history in relation to the Atlantic slave trade, to educate us about our responsibilities to live up to the, uh, the um, consequences of our past. Sir Jeff says, we cannot change the past, but we can change the consequences of the past. We can change the future. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to speak to an event of extraordinary importance in the beautiful country of Rwanda. And hopefully I can welcome many of you to Glasgow next year and help reset our planet on a safer, more just course together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Aitken. We're particularly inspired by the responsibility that your city is taking as being host of COP26, particularly in regard to equity issues, uh, which are so important to our continent of Africa. We now have a, a video clip that we'd like to share that we've received from our City of Glasgow colleagues, which documents some of the work that's been done in that city that relates to climate change. Glasgow is a city transformed, a city which continues to embrace change as it rises to the challenges of its past. A cradle of the Industrial Revolution, Glasgow's geography and proximity to natural resources turned a small port city on the banks of the River Clyde into the workshop of the world, building the ships and machinery which enabled an empire. The demise of our shipyards and factories in the last century heralded a turbulent period of deindustrialization, depopulation and decline. But Glasgow endured and has re-emerged as a vibrant, outward-looking city, playing its part on the international stage. Whether it's for hospitality, culture, sport, our skills and knowledge base, or our gift for scientific and technological innovation, the world knows about Glasgow again. As we continue our transition into a more sustainable city, Glasgow draws on its spirit of innovation and social justice to drive our efforts to overcome the legacies of our recent post-industrial past and to build better lives and better places for all of our citizens. And now, as host to the UN Climate Change Summit, COP26, we have an opportunity of global significance to promote and accelerate that transition to carbon neutrality, to build a cleaner, greener and fairer future. Carbon reduction and sustainability really are the issues of our times. Glasgow can show the world we are becoming the city of our times on the issues of our times. What an inspirational video. We now move to the next segment of our closing plenary where we will have a response from various funding agencies. And first up is none other than Mr. Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, who is the CEO of the Global Environment Fund or GEF as it's well known, which has since 1992 been dispersing funding to tackle the planet's most pressing environmental problems. And it is our honor to have a pre-recorded message from Mr. Carlos Manuel Rodriguez. Hello, this is uh, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, uh, CEO of the Global Environmental Facility. I'm, I'm very pleased to participate today in the Local Climate Solution for Africa Virtual Congress, um, uh, and particularly by the fact that the topic of this Congress is finance for change, something that um, is um, very well embedded in, in the GF uh, strategy. I, I first would like to congratulate the government of Rwanda and the city of uh, Kigali for leading this uh, very important Congress. I would like to say, began by saying that there's a large infrastructure uh, gap that currently exists uh, on the African continent. And, and there is a desperate need for funding and finance to flow to Africa not just to narrow down, down that infrastructure uh, gap, but also to accelerate uh, climate action. Uh, in this context, uh, Africa is experiencing the most rapid ur urbanization in the world. 
uh, ensuring that the, the urbanization contributes to, to economic growth, improve uh, li uh, livability, and at the same time uh, preserve the, its rich uh, nature and biodiversity is core to urban sustainability approaches in Africa through the different GEF uh, programs. Uh, we require a great leadership at the city and national level, which is emerging uh, with support from city networks uh, such as ICLEI, uh, which uh, the GEF uh, is pleased to work uh, with, um, with some of the cities and the city leaders. Uh, in this respect, the GEF uh, is supporting six uh, strategic cities in Africa, which includes uh, Johannesburg, uh, Dakar, eh, Abidjan, Kigali, Freetown, Marrakesh, uh, providing uh, funding of nearly $50 million. Improve uh, land use planning with integration of nature, nature-based solutions so, uh, such as uh, restoration of wetlands, which is the case in Kigali, urban plantations uh, like in Freetown and Abidjan, uh, promotion of uh, mass public transportation, like in the case of Johannesburg, flood management to improve drainage and nature-based solutions like in Dakar, integrated waste management and urban food production are some of the highlights. Uh, the GF through these uh, different investment in these six strategic cities is not only looking to generate this very important uh, um, climate and conservation outcomes, but most importantly, it, it is a catalyzer investment that uh, generates more uh, synergies at, at the city level. But in the context of uh, the COVID-19 uh, recovery, which is very much in uh, the GEF um, investment profile, we try to ensure that nature is integrated or is central to urban planning. Uh, so, enhancing institutional coordination across different departments and between national and city government is key in this uh, effort. Uh, we aim for green infrastructure and green, uh, green jobs. We look for improved waste management and decrease uh, air pollution at the same time that we uh, do an effort to enhance access uh, to finance uh, for cities to support their economic uh, re recovery. Uh, there is an import, an implicit importance in including gender and gender equality in finance decision, and, and the GF has been able to really internalize uh, these um, these uh, responsibility within all the all programs. So we work uh, closely with uh, female champion mayors, like the mayor of Freetown, which is a a, a world. Uh, leader in uh, greening up um, the, the different cities. Uh, in conclusion, I, I, I strongly believe that um, African most important asset is uh, their young people. With over 60% uh, of Africa's uh, 1 to point billion people below the age of 25, youth and entrepreneurship are key to transforming the sectors in Africa, Africa and help with the green uh, COVID-19 recovery process. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carlos, and great to hear your reflections in particular on the youth aspects. We had a strong theme of youth activation during Locks for Africa 2020, with one particular session focusing exclusively on youth activation, in fact, just before this closing plenary. And we also have a youth segment that is coming later in the program, so please stay tuned for that. We now are going to hear live from uh, Dr. Olafonso Samoran, who is the Regional Principal Officer uh, within the African Development Bank. Uh, Dr. Samoran is based in Kenya. And during uh, Locked for Africa this year, I had the privilege of moderating another session where Dr. Samoran participated and shared some really profound comments about the importance of data and widening our understanding and analysis of data to different sources. Um, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Samoran, you referred to that in other um, thank you, Megan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from Nairobi. 
Um, I also join others to congratulate the organizers of this um, very successful um, virtual Congress. I want to especially um, emphasize the quality of the conversation. Um, you know, you would not have thought or imagined that this could be possible over a virtual meeting. But I really want to say over the last eight days, the quality of the conversation has been very top notch. Congratulations to all of you. And for us at the African Development Bank, we're very pleased to be part of this. And as you said, Megan, indeed, I was part of one of the sections um, and we were talking about, you know, the importance of data, particularly when it comes to project preparation. And I, I want to just make a, a one point uh, as I just give my remarks today. And I think this conversation is very important. We must begin, we must embrace the notion uh, that there are multiple stories to be told about the risk and the impact of climate change that African cities and African population are facing. Um, part of those stories will be told through metrological data. Part of those stories will be told through knowledge, uh, local knowledge, but also some of those stories will be told through, you know, uh, the use of our existing systems, insurance systems, um, but also, you know, our, our also investment system. If we find a city spending a lot of money on repairing the road that should have lasted longer uh, than, you know, the, as expected, and it, which probably must have been caused by impact of flood or impact of, you know, uh, high temperature. Those are stories that we need to document. And in the case of Africa, again, let's re-emphasize that there's a place of multiplicity of storylines, multiplicity of data, and that notion is very important particularly as we get close to a situation globally where we have to show the adaptation rationale in order to assess funds. So today we're talking about climate finance and we must also understand the modalities, the challenges, but also the narratives that we need to put in place if we need to mobilize and increase access to climate finance to um, African cities and African countries. Um, at the African Development Bank, I think I want to emphasize, speak on behalf of my uh, superiors and emphasize uh, the, the close collaboration with ICLEA and all the parties represented here. We're talking of African cities. These are also our members uh, constituencies. These are countries that we're investing heavily in. And I want to emphasize again that the bank will continue to take investment in climate action seriously. Uh, we have been doing a lot. We must recognize from where we came from, we've invested a lot. A lot of our cities are actually right now creating climate fund, spending part of their own uh, annual budget resources to investments that are consistent with climate actions. We must incre increase the support to them. We must recognize that you know we can mobilize additional resources to support some of the brilliant ideas on the ground. Let me emphasize one thing again. Um, the bank over the next five years, from 2021 to 2025, has committed to investing $25 billion of its own resources. Let me say this, we call it $25 billion uh, by 2025 of our own resources into actions that are consistent with climate resilience, uh, but also uh, you know, climate mitigation, in many African cities as well. And I think it's very important and I'm happy that a lot of uh, mayors are here and a lot of our, our government officials and other stakeholders. It's important to encourage our, our mayors and our, our stakeholders to be part of the, the design and the implementation of the nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. This is something that is very important. This strategic document becomes, is going to become the rallying point. It's also be, going to become the roadmap for most of us as well. And so for the bank and also for the work that ICLA is doing uh, going forward on the roadmap, we will be happy to support this. We want to strengthen and deepen our partnership with you. Uh, on the one hand, we, we can use our convening power to bring different stakeholders around the table to look into innovative financial mechanisms uh, to finance investment on the ground. On the other hand as well, we want to also help our countries and our cities to improve their capacity to develop bankable projects. It's very important. 
uh, that we can take advantage of more opportunities out there and, and also continue to push forward the agenda of city and development in our cities. Thank you very much. This has been a very, very fruitful conversation. And we hope that this is the beginning of a long-term conversation. It doesn't end here. And I'm pleased to announce that the bank will be happy to support this process. Thank you. Over to you, Megan. Thank you so much, Dr. Samoran. And we in particular really want to acknowledge the leadership of the African Development Bank in financing adaptation work, which is a huge priority on the African continent. Um, and this has been exceptional from the African Development Bank. It's now my great pleasure to move into the next segment, which is looking to the future and calls for action. And we're very honored to be able to introduce Sir Nicholas Kay, who's going to be joining us live. He is the regional ambassador for Africa of the COP26 presidency. And we'd be here all day if I went through his bio and all that he's achieved. But in particular, he served as a, a multiple ambassador appointments for the United Kingdom and has advised the highest levels of the United Nations. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much indeed, Megan, and uh, good afternoon to, to all the uh, participants. Um, I hope you can hear me. These are always delicate moments when you come online and start talking to yourself and realise that nobody's actually receiving you. But I will continue on the basis. Great. Fantastic. There's some positive feedback already. Um, let me let me just thank you very much for inviting me as a representative of the COP26 presidency to, to this important meeting uh, today. Um, you certainly don't need me to tell you that uh, Africa and African nations are, are among the most impacted in the world by climate change, uh, and despite being the least responsible for, for global emissions. Uh, your floods, your droughts, cyclones, locusts are already having a profound effect on food security and costing lives and livelihoods. And we know that unchecked, the economic impacts of climate change will be severe. And you know we are all setting ambitious targets increasingly to reduce emissions, net zero by 2050, et cetera. Uh, but that is 30 years away. And in those 30 years, Africa is going to face enormous climate-related challenges and disasters. So action needs to start now. We recognize, as the United Kingdom, we recognize the immediate threat of climate change, as well as the immediate need to finance adaptation and resilience. Uh, and uh, it was very good to just catch now the African Development Bank and their contribution is vital on this issue. And collectively, we all need to make sure in the coming 12 months that we work hard to produce better solutions to adaptation and resilience and funding for it. Um, that's why, as incoming presidency of COP26, it, a focus on adaptation and resilience and on public and private climate finance is at the heart of our approach. Uh, just this week, uh, our Prime Minister Boris Johnson has appointed a high-level champion for adaptation and resilience, our former uh, development uh, secretary. Uh, and Marie Trevelyan, again, just a sign of the priority that we are giving to uh, adaptation and resilience. Um, and I think that probably aligns closely a lot of what you have been discussing in this virtual conference over the last 10 days, as well as the need for significant climate finance commitments from donors it's also important that we build a financial system fit for net zero uh, and that means fundamental changes to the way investment decisions are made by public and private sector businesses and financial institutions need to move beyond seeing climate change 
only as a corporate social responsibility issue to recognizing it as a financial and strategic imperative. Just this week in, in London, uh, the City of London hosted, some of you may have been able to join or follow, the Green Horizons Summit. And I commend the, the proceedings to you. There was a lot of good things, a lot of announcements that were quite important, including a UK announcement from our finance minister, Chancellor of Exchequer, who announced the UK's first green bond that it will be issuing as of next year. And this, I think, is again a sign of the sign of the times um, and a sign of the UK commitment on climate finance. We're committed to use the UK's global influence to accelerate the greening of the global financial system, including through our role as founding members of the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action and through hosting COP26 next year. And while this transformation in the financial sector gathers pace, it must be matched by continued real economy action worldwide to mobilize and accelerate flows of private finance into key clean growth and environmental sectors. The economics of it are changing dramatically daily. It is becoming the cheaper option to invest in new generation of electricity from renewables than from any other uh, So the economics are to accept that. are all spring from you know, the COVID-19 and why we're meeting virtually and it has benefits and uh, disadvantages as well. But the dual challenge of COVID-19 and climate change mean that we need to build an inclusive, resilient and prosperous future. Um, one that is prepared for the impacts of climate change, which we cannot mitigate. And that delivers, particularly in port in Africa, delivers a We seem to be losing to Nicholas K. So Nicholas K, it might work better if uh, you just put your video off and we could just hear you. I think the bandwidth would be able to handle that. You're just breaking up on our side. And I do. So we seem to have lost Sir Nicholas Kay. We'll try and get him back so he can complete his speech. But otherwise, I think we heard enough to know about the urgency with which the UK is taking on the mantle of climate change, which is so important on our continent. Next, we go to uh, Mr. Ruff Tut, who's the Director of the Global Solutions Division of UN Habitat. And as ICLI, we've worked for many years with UN Habitat, uh, currently implementing the second phase of the Urban Low Emissions Development Program, being implemented in 65 cities and 10 countries. And I'm going to pause before we play his video just to see. Uh, so, Nicholas K, do you want to give it one more go? Let's see if your video uh, streaming will work well. Let's try. Why not? Great. No. <laughs> I can hear myself though. <laughs> the question is, can you hear? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Maybe it's better if you just keep your video off and then we can complete your speech because we'd love to hear. Yeah, you. I've changed I've changed server here, so I think we may I don't know, we'll see how we go. Great. Um, uh, I was I think just talking to you about the AU. UK Green Recovery Action Plan that we're in the process of finalizing with the, with the African Union. And that is a plan for recovering from COVID that gives an equitable and green and resilient recovery. And climate finance, renewable energy, and energy efficiency are all at the heart of that, that plan. 
and we are committed to working in partnership with African nations to protect and enhance the natural environment and biodiversity and promote sustainable and climate resilient agriculture as well across the continent. Um, and so we believe nature-based solutions can be responsible for as much as a third of necessary emissions mitigation actions. But in order to take this opportunity, the world needs to increase significantly the level of funding for these nature-based solutions from the really low 3% of total climate finance that is currently committed to nature-based solutions. A whole of society is also a very fundamental point for our COP presidency. We recognize that there is no way we can succeed in tackling climate change purely through national government action, even though I represent a national government. The ambitious actions of cities and regions alongside individuals, businesses, civil society and youth is essential to success. As local governments, those on the line today and at your conference, you have closer relationships with your businesses and communities and are really able to drive forward ambitious climate action. And we welcome initiatives like this conference to get together and share best practice. It's important that these kinds of events are happening now because with the delay in COP26 caused by the COVID epidemic, we need to sustain momentum. And the, the Everything we are doing as the UK incoming presidency of COP26 is designed to make sure that we sustain interest and attention and resources for the, at least the next 12 months up till the conference of the parties in Glasgow next November. That's why next month we are convening a climate ambition summit which will be on the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. And uh, we're convening it alongside the United Nations, uh, France, Chile and Italy. And this will be a chance for leaders across the world to demonstrate their commitment to the Paris Agreement and a green resilient recovery from COVID-19 and to make announcements on adaptation, mitigation and importantly, climate finance. The clue is in the title. The title of the summit is Climate Ambition Summit. And we are really hoping and expecting that everybody will step up with ambitious new announcements. Finally, let me close uh, by mentioning that uh, my colleague, Nigel Topping, the climate champion for COP26, we are committed, he and I, to working in partnership with you in the run-up to COP26 and beyond. And I say beyond because obviously COP27 will be hosted in Africa. And I welcome the leadership that you are all taking on this challenge, the ambitious plans that you have, and the success you are already demonstrating in building adaptation and resilience to current and future climate impacts. Your role as strong advocates at the local level for ambitious climate action at home and internationally is integral to achieving our aims. And you can be assured that the UK joins you in that ambition. Thank you for the attention and I hope the sound has been maintained. And as Sir Nicholas Kay, thank you. It was maintained throughout, which is wonderful. And thank you so much for joining us today. And wonderful that you mentioned uh, Mr. Nigel Chopping. Uh, we had the privilege of him joining us in the opening ceremony where he made an intervention. And we're, of course, collaborating with him and others in the Race to Zero Dialogues, amongst other things. We're now going to go to that intervention from Mr. Ruff Toots from UN Habitat. I'll hand over to him now.
city leaders, colleagues, and friends. It is clear to us all that current levels of climate finance in Africa are insufficient to meet the region's needs to mitigate and adapt to climate change. For adaptation alone, it is estimated that by 2050, the region will need an additional investment of 50 billion US dollars annually, which is likely to increase further into the future. However, over this past week, many innovative ideas and approaches to climate financing have been discussed, and these conversations are vital. Investing in climate can help drive green urban economic recovery and facilitate the transition to carbon neutral cities on the continent. Climate action requires well-defined and designed actions, which are bankable to their fullest. Achieving this is already a challenge in many African cities. Often proposed projects for resilient infrastructure and urban development in cities do not get implemented because local institutions do not have the capacity to develop projects that prove feasibility and the generation of returns on investment. The cities partnering with ICLI and with UN Habitat are all working to address these dimensions. We need to place a lot of emphasis on building financeable projects from the onset. Supporting cities to be capable of financing local climate action is where the international community and peer support is needed for today. It's an idea that is strongly supported and promoted by UN Habitat and ICLI. Most of such investments call for public sector involvement and financing. And UN Habitat, through the city's investment facility, is supporting over a dozen national governments to access climate finance to fund critical resilient building and adaptation of infrastructure. UN Habitat is also supporting cities to work together with communities and local stakeholders to identify their resilience building needs and develop bankable projects for building resilience in urban areas with tools such as City Wrap, which has already been tested in over 30 African cities. Discussing financing in a more technical way is also important. Resources needed are enormous and cities need multiple financing mechanisms in place. The role of public and private finance needs to be considered and the diversity of sources and mechanisms that are at play. Innovative tools need to be built into projects which strengthen local finance. Thereby cities require capacity development and in many cases also the authority to utilize alternative mechanisms of fundraising, including in partnerships with the private sector and through capital markets. Enhancing the credit worthiness of cities is key to ensure the large scale finance that needs to be mobilized so that cities can succeed in local climate action. Cities alone often lack the capacity and authority to access available sources of financing, such as private sector and capital market mechanisms. In order to unlock private capital, it's important to work with countries and cities to improve their credit worthiness. To achieve this, cities need to increase their own source revenues, as well as to improve administrative processes, planning instruments, and overall economic stability. Capital investment planning tools can be applied for strategic investment and prioritization of projects. Making use of strategic spatial plans to prioritize projects can help identifying projects with transformative impact and help accessing finance more easily. Climate change solutions such as public transport, efficient and low carbon buildings, parks and blue and green networks, ecosystem-based adaptation, nature-based solutions, waste management, sanitation, and land use planning need solid urban planning and design to be implemented in a sustainable way. Both vertical and horizontal integration of climate change and urban development policies will be critical. Embedding local climate action into wider national plans for climate change action is key to ensuring impact and encouraging financing climate change initiatives locally. Developing climate responsive national urban policies and integrating urban and human settlements issues into national adaptation plans is an effective mechanism to channel national level climate finance to the local level. 
When thinking of public resources, own source revenue needs to be emphasized. In African cities, own source revenues are being mobilized in a very limited way. This is not only due to the weak economic capacity and value creation of cities, but also because it's often a neglected source. At UN Habitat, we are supporting cities to increase locally generated and equally distributed revenues, which involves supporting cities in unlocking untapped revenues, such as those arising from property tax and land-based finance. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, Building economic resilience has proven to be an essential part of cities' capacity to respond to stresses and shocks. This requires, amongst other factors, solid municipal finance with a stable input of own source revenues generated locally. In addition, a diversified economy, improving the conditions of informal workers and enhancing and securing essential services and supply chains are very important. Green public spaces, Parks and blue and green networks have proven to be essential to public health during the pandemic. African cities are experiencing and will experience severe effects of climate change. We are called to action now, today, to be prepared to respond to these effects. Urban climate change issues need to be prioritized in the agendas and policies of African countries. We have an important opportunity to shape the African cities of the 21st century as low carbon, resilient and livable cities. In closing, I would like to congratulate the organizers with the excellent running of this Congress and I wish you all the best with the follow-up and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Raf. We now turn to one of our own, Mr. Yunus Arakan, who's the Director of Global Advocacy at ICLE. And Yunus has been leading ICLE's charge on global advocacy for many, many years, particularly in relation to ICLE's role as the local government and municipal authorities focal point within the UN Climate Change Convention. Yunus, thank you for being with us today and over to you. Thank, thank you, Megan. It's, it's a great honor to, to join this very, very exciting panel. Uh, before starting all my interventions, of course, I'd like to commend uh, the hosts, uh, the government of Rwanda, city of Kigali, uh, Covenant of Mayor of Sub-Saharan Africa, Ralga, and of course, our dear Ikle Africa Secretariat. I'm impressed, uh, literally. I mean, I've been in following, of course, for years, but uh, the diversity of this session uh, from east and west and south and north, uh, from capital cities to intermediate cities, uh, rural cities, you are reflecting the really the power and the motivation and enthusiasm of Africa with all your partners from national institutions as well and the global partners. So comment and big applause. Um, what I would like to uh, share here is um, a couple of uh, updates or at least the background on the, the, the current Paris Agreement state of art in terms of cities and regions uh, uh, some updates on our local government climate roadmap towards COP26, which we are proud now to have also Ralga joining us, uh, and also relevant to your topic, which is uh, the finance. Uh, starting with this Paris Agreement, and the, the atmosphere we are, we are seeing here is exactly the spirit of the Paris Agreement. Uh, what was achieved is that it is a race to zero in the neutrality, but it is a collective action. And in that sense, it's not anymore like the previous era where everyone was waiting for the other to make an ambition. But in fact, uh, it is a, a race to zero that whoever joins this process, whoever joins these activities is the one who is winning because it is the building of a new future. And Africa, as mentioned, the, the, uh, the fastest is one of those. In that sense, Rwanda has shown an ambitious leadership by submitting the first uh, second NDC uh, for the first time from Africa. And uh, obviously, over the past years, we have always been working with the hosts of African COPs like Morocco, South Africa, uh, and with the local governments here. In this case, uh, Ralga and city of Kigali, even though it's not clear whether they will host the COP or not in 2022, but they are stepping up and joining the global movement. For sure, uh, we will be happy to open the doors together with our, our global networks um, so that Ralga can continue the, to lead uh, the efforts. Um, in that regard, local government climate roadmap uh, announced that uh, Madrid 2019 had six main goals, which is raising ambition, uh, NDC multi-level integration, uh, local climate finance, uh, mitigation and adaptation, balance and, and integration of circular economy and nature, as well as 
um, and uh, ambitious uh, expansion of the global climate agenda, including ministers of urbanization. So as you have seen, this uh, agenda of, of locks for Africa perfectly fits into the context of climate finance. So um, what we will be very looking forward to is to hear the final outcome. Uh, maybe we could uh, recall that uh, a couple of weeks ago there during the the UN Climate Week in New York uh, in September and during the Daring Cities, we have made uh, a major step forward. The GAP Fund was uh, that was announced to, a year ago is now operationalized. ICLA is one of those partners and the other partners like GCOM, uh, Global Covenant of Mayors. Um, the Transformative Actions Program, which is the, the facility to channel the, the, the investments, will be launched in the second in next phase in next week. So that if we have announced strategic roadmap for African cities for climate finance, that is the best way to announce so that we present um, to, to, to funders, to, to, to project facilities, uh, so that African share of the, the global finance is accelerated. Uh, and in particular that, that these ambitious uh, initiatives are rewarded with appropriate resources. In that regard, uh, as mentioned, I, with, with the contribution of Bralga, we will continue as the, the LGMA constituency, in addition to our co co collaboration with Race to Zero and Presidencies, we will also contribute to the negotiations that is advancing over the next couple of weeks and years so that the proposals are tabled in the, the UNFCC process with the African group who has now officially supported uh, ambitious engagement of all stakeholders in the UNFCC process. That's again an unprecedented move from African continent as well. So that it all shows that in this era of Paris Agreement, in the race to zero, in the new uh, decade for sustainability action, Africa is one of those front runners that you don't have to wait for anyone, that, but you can be the, the leapfrogging, as you have heard from Mayor of Glasgow, that Africa can let, take lessons learned and design the new cities of the, the, the low emissions uh, generation of the, the nature friendly generation that in African cities that we can nourish this. With this, um, once again, I'd like to commend all the, the hosts and partners. Uh, once again, congratulations on, on your efforts. Uh, and with this, I'd like to thank you all and com com uh, wish you the best of success. Thank you so much, Eunice. We're always so inspired by the depth of your knowledge and your inspirational words. So we really appreciate you being with us today. We now have got Mr. Manish Bapna, who's also joining us live, which is wonderful. He's the Executive Vice President and Managing Director of the World Resources Institute. And uh, ICLI has been working for a long time with WRI, most recently also with the NDC Partnership Group, uh, in particular, helping African countries implement their NDCs and raise their ambition. And so, uh, Mr. Bapna, we hand over to you for your thoughts in the closing ceremony today. Great, Megan, thank you. Um, thank you so much. It's a real privilege uh, and a pleasure to be with all of you today uh, at this closing ceremony on such an incredibly important topic, and not only for Africa, but for the entire world. Um, what, what I'd like to do is just say a couple of words about the World Resources Institute. Perhaps not all of you are familiar with our organization. We are a global research organization. Um, that focuses on issues related to climate change, cities, energy, food, forests, and the water. We have about uh, 1,200 staff located around the world. Um, most of our work is primarily in the developing, uh, in developing countries. And we have recently made a very significant investment in building out our presence in Africa. Our cities program actually has about 300 people around the world. Uh, and we now have a presence in Africa in several countries headed by a woman named Wanjira Mathai who is located in Nairobi. And what I wanted to do in my uh, few minutes here is just share five kind of interesting insights that we have learned related to climate in cities based on our work on this issue kind of worldwide over the past 10 or 15 years. And these are kind of important insights that are informing how our work will actually play out in, uh, in, in Africa itself. The first is, is kind of quite an interesting um, observation kind of lesson that we've learned, that when cities focus on providing more equitable access to public services, 
that can be a more politically durable way to tackle climate change and to improve economic productivity. So the point here is quite, it's quite unconventional. The point we're making is by focusing on equity, that is a very powerful lens through which to actually tackle climate and improve economic productivity. So by thinking about how one provides equal access or equitable access to housing, to water and sanita sanitation, to mobility, that these types of issues are absolutely critical. Over the past five years, we have uh, been working on our flagship report that we produce every few years called the World Resources Report. The title for this one is called Equal Cities for All, and it has a very significant focus on cities in Africa that, and the evidence that we have developed that lead us to this quite interesting conclusion about focusing on equity, a great way to get to sustainability. The second kind of insight I wanted to share had to do with resilience. And what we've realized is when cities want to focus on resilience, we need to look at not just the city itself, but the city and the broader region in which it is situated. If one looks at issues such as urban water resilience, looking just at the city doesn't enable us to actually address oftentimes the underlying drivers that are critical to tackling water resilience. We're actually piloting some projects in Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Kenya on this concept of looking at the city region scale to really advance resilience in cities. The third kind of insight is that financing for most cities in the developing world still heavily rely on national finances and national policy. So promoting urban climate solutions requires very active engagement with national governments, both on their policies and on their financing for cities. We've just completed two recent country or national level assessments around smart urban climate policy in both Ghana and Tanzania. Fourth is the kind of data and digitalization revolution. Incredibly significant. We see incredible opportunity to deploy kind of a data revolution to really help inform better transport and mobility planning. We've actually looked at providing digitalization into transport planning in Addis in Ethiopia, and we're looking to expand that in partnership with many other organizations across Africa. But this point about data and digitalization, the role that it can play in helping inform better transport planning and how that can lead to more public transit, more informal transit opportunities, more lower carbon, the more effective mobilization, uh, mobility is incredibly important. And the fifth and final point I wanted to make had to do with accessing climate finance and technical assistance to support NDC implementation. Um, as Megan noted, we host something called the NDC Partnership. This is a partnership involving over 100 countries, 20 major financial institutions. And the partnership is focused about how to provide technical and financial support to developing countries to help them implement their NDCs and enhance uh, their ambition. In the last two years, we have supported over 30 countries in Africa with over $300 million. And we plan to actually increase that in the coming years. One of the things we have done in the last few months is embed economic advisors in finance ministries to help finance ministries design recovery programs to COVID-19 in ways that better take into account climate action. Recognizing often that one must engage finance and planning ministries and not just environment or climate ministries to advance climate action and to do so in ways that support cities is an important priority for the NDC partnership in the coming year. We will continue to invest deeply in Africa and that might be another interesting source of support for African cities to advance commitments that may be made in their country's NDCs on subnational climate action. So let me, let me stop there. Uh, equitable access, uh, critical to low carbon action. Um, 
looking at the city regional scale, thinking about national urban policy, leveraging the data digitalization revolution, and really looking about how to access finance effectively are just a few of the insights that we plan to bring to deepening our work in Africa. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Please reach out to me or to my colleagues. We're here to support all of you in this incredibly important agenda. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Tara. Uh, look forward uh, to the rest of the remarks. Thank you so much, Manish, and particularly for joining us. I think it's very early hours of the morning there for you, um, although it's afternoon for us here in South Africa, but thank you so much for joining. We now move to the final segment of the closing plenary, one in which uh, I'm quite excited to see this. Um, it is a youth segment, and we got some of the young professionals here at ICLE Africa to reflect on a personal level what climate change means for them and what they're looking forward to in the future. So we now go to that video clip. Today we are here to discuss a critical player in the fight against climate change, the youth. And around the world, from South Africa to Sweden, we've seen young people take to the street to demand action to the climate crisis. And in some of our ICLE member cities, for example, in the informal community of George in Lusaka, we've seen that youths have developed poetry to communicate how their lives and their communities and their families have been affected by the climate crisis. And we were able to watch some of that poetry during this conference earlier this week. Rushing my teeth in pain, burning in the flames of chain. Splashes of fire, my eyes are thin. Lost in the burning desire, no more to gain. Stunning stains of sins, fall like rain. Every morning, the dark kind of morning, looking for water. The chairs of the water buckets are locked. People are being forced to be cameos. The thoughts of water in our brains are deep. Every morning, we walk about one kilometer in search of water. When I hear the sound of a roaster, I know it's about time. No time to study, no time to bath, but time to go and search for water. We march from one street to another, like a man in Sahara looking for an oasis. It's a combination of factors, and the climate change is one of those factors. The sea cow seeks for another, who can defend climate for the vulnerable in the slum. Blood of the days lying behind, no golden sunrise staring bright. Climate change is now a thought wandering in my mind. Living without water is provoking mankind. In the predicament of water, I now am I blind. slumber. Caught in lust, I ponder. Climate so slender. In this burning desire, I squatter. Brushing my teeth in pain. Burning in the frames of change. Splashes of fire, my eyes are tame. Lost in the burning desire, no more to gain. Stunning state of sins, fall like rain. And now I'd like to turn to some of the younger ICLE staff to speak to them about what they are passionate about around climate change and what their hopes and dreams are for the future. So over to you, Corrine. When we talk about climate change, what strikes me most is the fact that for a plague this big that affects each and every one of us in our daily lives and for which we are contributing enormously to, uh, quite a handful of people have very little understanding of what climate change actually means. We need to educate our children back at home even before they start going to school around the concepts of climate change. We need to incorporate climate change into all levels of our educational system. We need to simplify the concept of climate change so much so that those in the rural areas can understand it in their local languages. They can understand what causes climate change and at least what they can do to mitigate it. I'm very grateful for the opportunity ICLE Africa has offered me to work with cities, to work with development agents, agencies, to understand and to educate and enable others to understand what climate change is and what energy access is and what they can do to, to make a difference. Growing up, my passion has always been to work in this space where those in the rural areas, like my grandmother who has been for over 80 years without having electricity in her home, can get connected to electricity, can have light in her home by simply turning on the switch. And that's my passion for my career. I won't stop till I get there. Before I wrap up, I would like to implore all city leaders, all organizations, development agencies, local governments to give the youth a chance because they're full of full with lots of potential and it's only when we empower the youth that we'll be able to be guaranteed of a sustainable future. Vanessa, 
what what are your thoughts around climate change what are your ambitions and goals in the sector well just because we live in areas where climate change is not affecting us as much as other cities and countries does not mean it's not existing I mean, I grew up in a very small town in South Africa, which is hot and dry. And I remember there were days we did not have water, running water through our taps, and nobody thought climate change. And I also remember I used to swim in a river close to my house. And as the years went by, the river just went completely dry. And at that point, at that age, nobody thought climate change. So the, all those experiences from my childhood and the current ones have really contributed towards my passion for climate work. And they really forced me to remain in the space of environmental sustainability and climate change. So I would say as a young African female who's passionate about climate work, I'm, I'm in a very unique and fortunate position to, to work um, on climate related projects and one project here at ICLE is called the Urban Natural Assets and I think it's doing an amazing job of mainstreaming nature based solutions into land use planning and of course into local government um, decision making processes around river systems. So Solo, what would you say um, are your thoughts on climate change and why are you passionate about climate work? Thanks, Karine and Vanessa. Um, and I think you build upon quite very strong points, um, especially the, the, the ones of raising cons consciousness and calling to action um, the young people, for the young people to be more environmentally conscious and live uh, more sustainable lifestyles. And uh, in some of the work that we're doing and some of the projects we're exploring, it's really about um, what are the different lifestyle options that are available to enable us live um, good quality lifestyles but yet well within the planetary boundaries and also um, we have to acknowledge that we cannot do this alone we need the support of the local governments to provide for us the enabling environments um, the enabling infrastructure um, to be able to to live these sustainable lifestyles as young people and youth um, we have to hold our governments um, accountable and um, so that they're able to provide for us um, nutritious food, um, access to decent housing, as well as um, low carbon mobility options. So, and I think as a closing for me, it's really more about the initiatives we take as youth um, to be able to, um, to claim back our planet and to regenerate um, the nature. And uh, so my colleague Ben also works um, in the same environment and I would love to know um, what he thinks about um, uh, climate change and what he hopes um, for the future. Thanks, Green, Vanessa, and Solo. I think um, you all spoke to how important making sustainable development actually salient and, and real to people's daily lives is. And for me, addressing climate change is so urgent because without doing so now, it'll make progress in all aspects of development, be it health, um, education, food security, gender equity, all the more difficult and costly to actually secure um, and I think growing up in, and living in South Africa where the economy which is still so reliant on a huge minerals energy complex is still characterized by systemic unemployment and inequality has alerted me to how tackling the climate crisis cannot happen in isolation from tackling other crises um, working at ICLE Africa and particularly through the Urban Led 2 project which focuses on multi-level governance in particular um, has helped me understand the, the complexity and the naughtiness around the technical and the governance related aspects of affecting policy and importantly implementation in that climate change development nexus um, and shown me how National climate change ambition can't be achieved without local level action, but national support is also required to ensure that the, the mandate, the agency and the capacity is built from the ground up. A future that I'd want to see has to be defined by climate policy that today ensures equity on an international basis and intergenerational basis. And it has to be international because you need the flow of resources to go to communities and countries that most need them and it has to be intergenerational in that um, the next generation has to have access to the right to equitable resource access and this means involving youth and other marginalized groups in the decision-making processes right now. 
Um, and I know, Jurita, you had some thoughts around the Comsa project. Thanks, Ben. And I think that one of the points that you raised about how the world needs to work together. So international actors, actors in Europe, actors in Africa, all need to work together to build this climate resilient world. And I think one of the projects that I'm working on, the Covenant of Mayors in Sub-Saharan Africa, or COMSSA, um, does this so well because partnerships is one of the pillars um, from which the work is done in this in important initiative. And another part that I'm really passionate about this project is because we live in an urban era where we can all agree that cities are the driving force towards creating this global sustainable world that all of us have spoken about today because without helping city leaders across the world to plan and build projects which are at a bankable stage, we will not be able to achieve this environmentally conscious um, world that all of my colleagues um, have spoken so passionately about today. Um, and I think what came across in the conversation today is that young people in Africa and in the world are truly passionate about climate change. And it is time to allow them to voice these passions and voice these ideas and take them seriously, because that is what the climate crisis demands. It demands urgent action that is integrated, that is equitable, and that involves all voices of society to ensure that everyone is well informed and everyone is keen to working towards this world that we desperately need to build. Um, so today I'd like us all to join hands as youth, as everyone in um, this world right now and recognize that no matter who you are, no matter what your creed is, we need to come together and build a sustainable, climate resilient world. inspirational was that. We want to also just briefly say to all participants here today that all of our sessions from Locks for Africa 2020 will be available in the platform for the next 90 days. So please take your time at whatever time of day or night to view any of the past sessions, including this closing plenary. It is now my great pleasure to hand over to the Deputy Secretary General of ICLE and our Regional Director here in Africa to officially close Locks for Africa 2020. Quibi, over to you. Thank you, Megan, and thank you to our fantastic team in the Ikki Africa office. You didn't only see some of our youth um, hard at work and the passion in their voices and their eyes, and you can know that you're in good hands if you're in a city in Africa, in the cities network Ikki Africa, and in our partner, partner city networks with whom we cooperate so closely. Um, you also had a very, very quick glimpse at our beautiful offices in Cape Town. It's from here that we serve you. It's from here that we are dedicated absolutely 100% all the time to bring sessions like LOCKS to you. This is the fifth time that we are holding the Local Climate Solutions for Africa event. It's the first time that it is virtual, fully virtual. And I don't think we'll ever go back to only a physical event. This brings me to the point that we should not recover with a sense of wanting to go back to the normal after, after COVID-19. We should learn from that. We should take this moment, this opportunity granted humanity to rethink, re-establish and reconnect with the planet on which we all depend for our livelihoods. And it came out very, very strongly here yeah, that our, our development challenges are hugely interconnected and interdependent. And one cannot address the one without addressing the other. The social, the economical, the nature, the climate, um, all the SDGs, in fact, are deeply connected. And in LOCKS, we managed to bring all those agendas together under the banner of finance, because finance is probably the key to unlock us in, and set us on a road to a new future, a future that our youth want, a future for the people that spoke now, just before me in this segment. Africa has a youth bulge. The future is youthful in Africa. The future is also urban in Africa. More and more people are coming into our cities on a daily basis. And they're young and they're ambitious and they're hopeful and they're positive. And with this can-do spirit, it is our duty and Ike Africa's 
absolute commitment to all of our constituency, all our cities and subnational governments, that we will give it our all to make sure that these agendas converge in a way that makes life better for those who live in our cities, in and around our cities and our towns, regardless of whether it's a small city, a capital city, a rural city, an intermediate fast growing city, regardless of whether it's in North Africa, West, East, Central or South, or our island states. Our cities are connected deeply. There's so much that binds them together in our people, in our cultures here in Africa, but also globally with a global diaspora of people from Africa. Isn't humanity, isn't that the root of humanity anyway? So let's think of Africa as a continent of opportunity. And let's think of Africa as the way, as we were told today by leaders from other parts of the world that Africa can be the solution, Africa can be where we find our inspiration and where we find the solutions. And of course, these solutions need to happen on the ground. They need to happen in cities. We know we're not on track to meet any of the globally set development targets, whether it's climate, whether it's nature and other aspects too. But our best chance to start making bold and, and very, very scaled up action is to start locally. Build it from local up to global, city by city. And this we cannot do without very strong multi-level governance systems in place. Our national governments providing an enabling environment, taking hands with our cities, giving us seats at the table, showing to us that they are willing to partner with us as they do. And then for cities to take that opportunity provided by our national governments, and one city, one successful city has been known to inspire and change a whole country, set it on a new course. So imagine what 16,000 local governments in Africa can do if they take hands. The new Africa is waiting for us and we are taking a very bold first step today towards that new Africa. Eki Africa is committed as the secretariat also of the African Capital City Sustainability Forum and of the COMSA, the African uh, chapter of the Global Covenant of Mayors. And to each and every ICLI member who joined us today, thank you very much for your commitment and for your dedication to our network. For those cities who are not yet members of ICLI, please join us, take our hands, and we will unlock that finance. We will mainstream solutions so that cities can do what they need to do to improve their lives and build safe, accessible and open societies where people can flourish and live their dreams and be all they can be. I want to close off by saying thank you to my most fantastic team, Megan, Tara, I can't name everybody you met many of them during the course of the last two weeks and you engage men with many of them in projects all across Africa and indeed globally as well. We have the most fantastic team in our office in Nikki Africa. I'm proud of each and every one of you and I'm so grateful for the very long hours and the hard work and the dedication that went into this locks for Africa, our fifth one, our first virtual one, but I would say our most exciting and most inspirational one to date. Thank you very, very much to our co-hosts, the government of Rwanda and the city of Kigali, Ralga, our many friends in C40, UCLG Africa, so many partners came to celebrate this moment, came to actively participate in LOCKS uh, for Africa 2020. And we look forward to continue the discussions and also to bring this roadmap and action plan to COP26 as we've been invited to do. And we will certainly make sure that every single voice of every single city in Africa is heard and shared. And from our side, at this point in time, I'd like you to join me just for a finishing last little video from our side in gratitude towards all of you. Thank you very, very much. These last two weeks proved 
that there is hope. There's a lot of hope and there's action, a lot of action. We can scale it up and we can do this. We can do this together. Thank you. Virtual engagements and events like the one we are uh, participating today are crucial to keep the conversation, reflection and action on climate change. Perhaps nowhere is the work on climate action more important than in our cities and urban settlements. This is where the climate battle will be won or lost. 